this morning we're going to dive in, uh, right into Luke chapter 7. We're going to re be reading through verses 36 through 50. And I, want to, I want to take a look at this awesome event that's going to happen between Jesus, the Pharisee, and the woman, the sinful woman. And I hope today this message is uh, that you see how Jesus looks at us. And how, uh, I just want you all to sit there and, and look at yourselves also. Because there's, there's going to be time maybe at the end of the service, uh, I'm sorry, at the end of my sermon that uh, I kind of talk about us. And how sometimes we look at ourselves, but we also look at other people. But I also want you just to focus on how Jesus looks at us. So, Luke chapter 7, verses 36. It says this, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, let me just stop right there and say this about verse 36. Uh, this is setting a stage uh, for this event that's fixing to happen. And if you look where it says in Luke chapter uh, in, in 36, where it says uh, where Jesus reclined, in the Middle Eastern culture, uh, now, here's the Middle Eastern culture is way different than our culture here. Okay? Now, where it says Jesus reclined, Jesus didn't have his feet under a table, okay? It wasn't a West Texas, sorry, I'm not in West Texas anymore. It's not a Texas barbecue where you just come and recline at the table at somebody's house and eat some barbecue. His feet was not under the table. Normally, people would have uh, been around a low, U-shaped table. Maybe there was pillows or, or mats or blankets, whatever they used. Uh, around the table, and they were reclined away from the table, okay, leaning on their left arm, maybe eating food with their right arm and having a drink with their, their right arm. Two, also at this time, a prominent religious person of society, like a Pharisee, to invite somebody of fame like Jesus was huge. Uh, when events like this happened, what was neat is they would kind of have a, like an open door policy. Okay, where you can come in and listen. But in fact, for a Pharisee to have a lot of people, the more the merrier, okay, it made the Pharisee look like he was a big deal in that community. Um, but here's the thing. If you came, you couldn't eat or talk. But you could come in and sit and listen to them talk. They might be talking about theology, or they might be talking about how good the Spurs are doing this year. Okay, hopefully we get a championship out of that. Uh, but you can just come in and, and sit and listen. Now let's go to verse 37. It says, A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at, uh, at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Now picture this. Picture this woman. So sinful and dirty by the standards of the community. She was despised. She goes to the one place where she's hated and belittled the most. A house full of holy men. Now Jesus was the only holy person there, but a house of, full of holy men. I don't know about you, but to me, when I read that part of that sinful woman walking up there, and she has the guts to crush him. Uh, to crash that party. If we go on to verse 38, let's see what she does. It says, as she stood behind him, at his feet weeping, she began to wet his, his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed him, and poured perfume on them. Did you notice that it said that she came and stood behind Jesus? To me, that shows shame. I don't know about you, but I remember when I was a kid, man, I got in trouble all the time, okay? Parents are here, they can confess that I did. But every time when I was a kid, I got in trouble, I had to go up to them and tell them that I messed up. But for some reason, their backs were always towards me. So I had that walk of shame going up behind my parents. Now, I always got a whooping afterwards. But I always had that walk of shame like the lady in the scripture was, she was feeling such a shame. Then she wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. And she kissed them and poured perfume on them. Rabbis thought for a woman to let her hair down was a grounds of, to divorce. So for the woman to let her hair down, wipe Jesus' feet 
was a very intimate thing. She was shown that she was vulnerable, but she didn't care what anybody thought. Paul says in scripture that a woman's hair is her glory. That's why they take so long brushing the hair. It's their glory. A woman's hair is her glory. At that moment, she was saying to Jesus by her actions, I surrender all I am to you. It's about your glory, not about me. Now, let's talk about the perfume real quick. Perfume was very expensive. Commentators say probably the same of a working man's wage for a year. So for this poor woman who was not wealthy, perfume was certainly expensive. But to her, it was a great financial sacrifice. But more than that, what does this represent? She's in a hot, sweaty, smelly culture. And definitely there was some odor about people. Might have smelled like a boy's locker room. I don't know. They would usually wear perfume on their necklace, around their neck. They could pour it out easily like some of our bottles we have uh, today. Only thing that would escape would be the, the fumes. Uh, and it released a very desirable aroma. So she had to break the bottle to get it out and to pour it on Jesus' feet. She was, she was giving everything to him. Her tears, her hair, and perfume. I don't know if she knew she was going to get this emotional when she was approaching Jesus. Because remember, how does she wipe Jesus' feet? With her hair. She did not have a towel. The closer she got to Jesus, the more emotional she became. The more she recognized her sin. Isn't that true? The more we understand the glorious standard of God, the more we realize we fall short. There are Christians out there who aren't even convinced of their sin because they are so far from Jesus. Some of us are actually convinced we are okay because we think we're good. Look at verse 39. It says, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who, who, he's touch, who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owned money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he gave the debt, he forgave the debts, debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, for the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. Let me stop there and say this. A customary act of hospitality would then, uh, have been a kiss to greet a visitor. So in the Middle East, grown men kiss each other. Now men, thank God, we live in Texas, right? <laughs> I didn't hear any amens, but there you go. All right, let's move on to 46. Do not put oil on my head, but she had poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you how many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So the story that Jesus is telling Simon is a story uh, relating to these two people. The, the Pharisee and the woman. One owed much, one owed little. 
Now, I've heard people talk about this story and, uh, that Jesus told, and the only thing that people only focused on was the difference. One owed 50, one owed 500. One loved little, one loved a lot. The difference between these two uh, might seem obvious and easy to point out, but let's, I want to talk today about the three similarities that Simon and this woman uh, had. The first one is they both owed. If you look back at verse 41, this is two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Now, 300 denarii, I'm not saying that right, 300 denarii is a year's wage. So if I got my math right, my dad will tell me because he's a math teacher afterwards. One owed one and two-thirds of a year's wage, and the other one-sixteenth. Now, we'll be checking out because I just see distractions in a message, okay? Here's my point. One owed like ten times more than the other, but they both all owed. This must be established. Everyone owes. Romans 3.10 says, that it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Did you notice that God is repeating himself here? Kind of throwing in that one more parting shot at the end of this for emphasis. I believe the reason God put that here, the no, not one at the end, because he knows we argue with him. Have you ever argued with God before? Now, I know all you parents in here, you've argued with your kids. Dad, I want this. Mom, I want this. No, you can't have it. Because you're saying, I know when Judah gets older, okay, he might be turning 11 or 10, and he might come up to and say, Dad, I want to drive that white dragon. Okay, now, white dragon's my mini van. So don't judge me. Okay. But dad, I might want to drive the minivan. I'm going to say, Judah, you're 11. No. But dad, I want to. No. But dad, you said that I'm your little buddy. No. Have you ever done that with your kids? They want to grab them by the cheek and say, no. I'm saying no. But that is what God is doing here. No. Not one. None righteous. None that seeks after God. None that understands. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let me ask you this. How many apart from Christ are righteous? None. Not even. How many have fallen short of the glory of God? Oh. Well, I'm glad you answered me because my youth don't answer me sometimes. <laughs> I feel like you're listening. Just kidding. I love you. You're good. But how are these two people in this story similar? They both owed. The second thing that they're similar is they both could pay. Notice why. Verse 42 says, And when they had nothing with which to repay. In that culture, they had something called the debtor's prison. No, how, no matter how much you owe, guess what? You were put in prison. That was the deal. Here's a little illustration. Suppose you go to sleep tonight and a little tiny poisonous spider crawls up and bites you and you die. It's unfortunate. Okay, that's that. <laughs> now, what if it were a man-eating tiger or a lion? How about a, a liger? Okay, the mix of two. That comes in your room and just rips you apart, rips your arms and legs off, just mauls you to death. Also unfortunate. Doesn't matter which, both times you're dead. If it's a spider, you're pretty dead. If you if it's the tiger, you're ugly dead. <laughs> but either way, you're dead. Neither of you can pay. The reason why they couldn't pay is because they had nothing. Everyone in this place, even me, is bankrupt before God. Nothing you can offer God for your sin. Isaiah 64, 6 says this, 
For we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. What are some of your righteous acts? Is it tithing? What about prayer? Go on the Bible study. Guess what? It doesn't say all bad deeds. It says the best about us compared to God's righteousness is still a filthy rag. Does anybody want to know what a filthy rag is? Go on the internet and look it up. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about it here. I'm not saying to avoid righteousness or give up on doing righteous deeds. I'm just saying they don't compare to God's. Now let me give you a poor analogy. I don't know if this is going to work, but let me describe it. If you are standing on the earth and see a man killed next to Mount Everest, you can notice the difference in the height of the two. Now go 25,000 miles up into space, turn around and look back at earth. Can you now? No. That's what I'm trying to show you today is God's righteousness is so far and so high above ours. We can't even comprehend it. You may have done all these righteous deeds. You may feel like Mount Everest because you see some of the anthills around you. But you're not even close to God. Do you know what the good news is? 2,000 years ago, Jesus says, Hey you, I'll trade you. Your sin... For my righteousness. Jesus is our great substitute. Scholars call this the vicarious death because he died in our spot. Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The only time Jesus didn't address God as father because it was the only time he wasn't being treated like a son. So you and I could be. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. So that we might become the righteousness of God in, God in him. 1 Peter 2.24 says. He himself bore our sins in, in his body on the tree. So that we might die to sin and sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Galatians 3.13 says, But Christ rescued us from the law's curse. When he became a curse in our place, this is because the scriptures say that anyone who is nailed to a tree is under a curse. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteousness for our unrighteous, to bring good, bring you to God. I read a story about a little boy. Let me read it to you. It's about a little boy whose sister needed a blood transfusion. 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 The doctor explained that she had the same disease the boy had recovered from two years earlier. Her only chance for recovery was a transfusion uh, from someone who had previous, previously conquered this disease. Since the two children had the same rare blood type, the boy was the ideal donor. Would you give your blood to Mary, the doctor asked. Johnny hesitated. His lower lip started to tremble. Then he smiled and said, sure, for my sister. Soon the two children were wheeled into the hospital room. Mary, pale and thin, Johnny, good and healthy. Neither of them spoke, but when their eyes met, Johnny grinned to his, at his sister. As the nurse inserted the needle into his arm, Johnny's smile faded. He watched the blood flow through the tube with the ordeal almost over. His voice, slightly shaky, broke the silence. Doctor, when do I die? Only, don't let me cry. Only then did the doctor realize why the little boy hesitated, why his lip trembled when he agreed to donate his blood. He thought giving his blood to his sister meant giving up his life. In that brief moment, he made the great decision. The little boy fortunately didn't have to die to save his sister. Each of us, however, has a condition more serious than Mary's. 
And it required Jesus to give his blood, but also his life. Jesus pays our debt. What Jesus says is, God has come to forgive debt. So they both owed, they both could pay. And thirdly, they both were freely forgiven. If you look at verse 42, it says, he freely forgave them both. Let me remind you who's telling this story, it's Jesus. When Jesus talks about forgiveness, Jesus uses the word freely. Did, uh, did either one have to pay anything? No. Did one who owed 500 have to pay back some because it was more? No. Jesus forgives more freely than we in the church today like to admit. Now, not this church, because I've heard good things about you, okay? But there's other churches out there. Jesus forgives more freely than we in the church like to forgive. We want people to pay for what they've done. Jesus forgives freely. So they both owed. They both couldn't pay. They both were, uh, of their debts were forgiven. Now, real quick, let me talk about the differences real quick. Jesus set these amounts in his story. One owed 50 silver coins, the other 500. Now, let's think about this. If 50 is best, going to church, involved in a life group, tithing, treating others well, not cussing, having a worship song for your ringtone. <laughs> now, 500, if 500 is worse, that's murder, abuse, adultery, Rooting against the cowboys. <laughs> where, where would you rank yourself in between those two, huh? Not good, but not worse. But let me give you some shock, shocking news. Everyone in this place, even me, is a 500. Let me give you an example. Years ago, Billy Graham was on The Tonight Show with uh, Johnny Carson, and this is before Jay Leno stepped in. Johnny Carson says, Dr. Graham, can I ask you a personal question? Have you ever broken one of the Ten Commandments? Billy Graham says, I've broken them all. Johnny Carson is shocked. What? Now remember, he's on national TV saying this. Carson said, well, what do you mean? The Bible says... If you've broken one, you've broken all, them all. You, also John Carson, have done the same thing. That's why Jesus died on the cross. The if we are all 500s, why did Jesus set these amounts, 50 and 500? If we look at verse 39, it says, When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, <laughs> I say, said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. And did you notice out there says that Simon spoke to himself? And Jesus answered, uh, Jesus answered, he didn't say that Jesus said, it says he answered. And what's funny is after Simon was saying if he was a prophet, you know, Jesus answered his thought, this is a little Jedi move there, you know. Um, but this story Jesus tells is the answer to Simon's thoughts. We interpret this story all wrong. We think that some people owe more than others, uh, than those who have been forgiven the most will love more. Do you know that that keeps people in bondage sometimes? So you got a girl who's been saved since she was nine and hasn't been uh, delivered from anything, thinking, and when she's listening to a guy who is... I don't know, maybe in his, maybe he's 35, and he's saying, man, I've been delivered through this and this and this. And that nine-year-old, or that lady who was saved when she was nine, saying, man, God didn't do that. Man, his testimony is way better than mine. But you know what the guy is saying? It's like, man, I'm a 500. He's looking at that girl who's been saved since she's nine, saying, man, I wish I was a 50 like her. Jesus was saying, Simon, I need to adjust your thinking. And here, and here is what he says. Because you, uh, because you think you're a 50, 
You'll never love me as much as she does. But Simon, if you would understand you are a 500 also, you can love me as much as this woman. Do you know Satan has two lies he uses a lot? One is you're better than other people and you're worse than others. It was crazy at times in my life. At the same time, Jesus, uh, not Jesus, Satan has, has said that to me. When you believe these lies, it affects everything you do. Jesus said, if you don't understand you've been forgiven much, you won't love me very much. This is what the whole Bible is about, is about loving much. In fact, if you remember in Matthew 22, it's where the Pharisees tried to chip, trick Jesus uh, with a question about the greatest commandment. And Jesus comes up and he sums it up and he says two things. He says, love God and love others. Here's the thing. If you feel like you have uh, needed grace, you won't love God. If you think you're better than others, you won't love them. If you hate yourself, you won't love them either. Jesus was saying, you're missing it, Simon. We all owe the same amount. <clears throat> Jesus paid the same for every person here. You can release that shame to Jesus. And you can still do sometime. Sorry, you can do still do it. Some of you, God brought you out of some crazy stuff. It was drugs or you just had a bad life. You get saved, you're still in bondage. If you think that, you'll still have shame. Every person here has fallen since we've received Christ. Satan will come to you after you've been saved at a time and, and maybe you sin. And Satan was going to come up and he's going to say, you should have known not to do that. That's where shame, that's where we bring shame into our life. So we feel we're not good enough for God anymore. We need to stop thinking that because Jesus died for all of our sin, past, present, and future. Why do you see yourself as better, as worse? Jesus died for every sin we have ever committed and ever will commit. He died to take our shame. We love this woman, I love this woman in the story. She's amazing. Aren't you glad the Bible talks about how uh, that we're not great people all the time, just like her? She walks into this place, maybe something not like this, but has walked to a, a place where they're talking about uh, maybe God. She walks in broken. She's honest. She starts weeping. Today, if you want to cry, Pray all you want. Tell Jesus you're sorry and receive forgiveness of sin. A woman like her had probably never been treated with such dignity and respect by a man until Jesus. Yet she trusted him and went to him. Why? Not sure what interaction they had in the past. Some commentators believe that she probably heard Jesus say, Come to me, you who are tired and heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus asked, Simon, do you see this woman? Um, yes, she's sitting in my living room. No. Do you see her, Simon? Like, really see her? See her. How do you see people? Lamentations 3.21 says, Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The unfailing love of the Lord never ends. But His mercies have, uh, we have been kept from complete destruction. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin fresh each day. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in Him. Praise God. Praise the Lord. We're not under the wrath of God, but under His mercy. Amen. When Jesus told the sinful, sinful woman, you are forgiven, she, uh, she saw Jesus' mercy fall on her. So here's my final thought for this morning. I believe we really begin to fall in love with God when we begin to understand the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
when we begin to grasp the full beauty of what Christ has done for us, we move to a place of deep affection, gratitude, and true worship. I believe on that day, the woman understood Jesus. And I hope today, as we leave this place, that you understand Jesus a little bit more. That what he's done for us, there was a purpose. And know that we're all 500s. We all, at one time, owed, we couldn't repay. But Jesus fully uh, forgave our sins.